I'd like to call the meeting to order, and with that, please, the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And if you all would mind, in your own way, say your uh, prayers for Lieutenant Bussey and his family. Thank you. Ms. Snyder, would you call the roll, please? Yes, ma'am. Mayor Marino? Here. Vice Mayor Marciano? Here. Council Member Woods? Here, ma'am. Council Member Lane? Here. Council Member Litt? Here. Okay. We have. I see no additions, no deletions, but we do have some modifications under resolutions. Item B, Resolution 49, 2017, establishing the Charter Review Committee. There has been a small amendment to sentence 5B on page two. It will now read each council member will be entitled to appoint one member to the committee and may provide two or three names for consideration. Each appointment shall be subject to and conditioned upon approval by a majority vote of the entire council. So may I please have a motion to accept? Motion to accept. Second. 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 Thank you. And now we have some announcements and oh, presentations. Questions. I'm sorry. You have to call the question. Oh, I apologize. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. This is why we have Max. <laughs> um, announcements and presentations. I'd like to invite up Senator Bobby Powell. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Council, for indulging me for a moment. That was Ben Durgan, who served as a legislative assistant in my office. I am so glad to be back home from Tallahassee and also back in the city of Palm Beach Gardens, where I am a graduate, a Gator, a graduate of Palm Beach Gardens High School class of 1999. And there were many, many days as a member of the track and field team that I ran right past this site and played on this site, played here, and I'm glad to be here. I am Bobby Powell, Jr., State Senator for Senate District 30, which starts in Palm Beach, the island, and goes, covers all of West Palm Beach, goes through Royal Palm Beach, and then comes north, where we capture this great city of Palm Beach Guards and go to the county line, where we get everything south of Martin County. This is your Senate District 30 legislative update. I want to recognize also here with, well, not with me, but also here somewhere is my, my legislative colleague, Representative Rick Roth, who shares this uh, particular area with me, and it's great to serve with him. As you know, we are the Florida legislature. We are 160 members strong. There are 40 senators, which I am glad to be a part of, glad to be in the Senate, where we do a few things. We stop bad legislation, we help to pass good legislation, and we also appropriate funding, which is very, very important. And, and to help do that, especially when it comes to the appropriations piece. I saw him here earlier as Mr. Matt Forrest, who is our Palm Beach Gardens lobbyist, who is very, very important and very instrumental when it comes to getting things done uh, in Tallahassee, especially with regard to this great city. He was instrumental in making sure that we did the septic to sewer hookups, uh, and, and that was put into that, that uh, budget bill that we did. Palm Beach County has 13 legislators. I am the chair of the Palm Beach County Legislative Delegation. I am one of four senators. The other senator uh, who used to represent this area, um, well, Senator, I said Senator Abruzzo represented this area, but also parts of the area were represented by Senate President Joe Negron, who I've worked very, very well with as the Senate President to get some of the things done that we were able to get done this year. What's important is I also serve as the Vice Chair of the Transportation, Tourism, and Economic Development Appropriations Committee. 
that's important because we have a lot of infrastructure projects here in Palm Beach County that we need to work on and that we have worked on and we're, we're continuing to get funding for. It's great to be in the Senate because in the Senate I got an opportunity to serve as the chair of the Joint Select Com Committee on Collective Bargaining. As you see this picture here, you see the Senate. This is not the Senate. This is the House. In the Senate, we're a little bit more reserved, so you really don't see us waving our hands that much. As a matter of fact, I tell people, some of my friends who were in the House when I was in the House, you know, way back when, uh, when they walk over, I tell them you can actually feel the air change when you walk to the Senate. Some of the biggest issues that we dealt with this year in the legislature, and this year with a big year, where we ended up, instead of going the traditional 60 days, we had a 63-day session in order to finish up the budget in that final three days. And then we ended up going back for a special session to do a number of things amongst those, uh, appropriate funding for Visit Florida, Enterprise Florida, and also to solve our mystery that dealt with medical marijuana. Other issues we dealt with, Lake Okeechobee drainage issues and discharges. Uh, education was big this year. Healthcare, uh, opioids. We, we passed legislation with regard to fentanyl and car fentanyl. Uh, sober homes, uh, the marketing of sober homes, not only in uh, Palm Beach Gardens, but also all over Palm Beach County. Delray, as, as you look into the newspaper every day, we see that people are continuing to die from drug overdoses, but we also see in the newspaper nearly every day or every week, I'll say someone's being arrested for patient brokering or something to deal with, um, with, with sober homes. And I'm glad that the State Attorney's Task Force is, is working diligently on that. One of the biggest attacks that we had this year in the legislative session was this attack on home rule. And I mean, it was all over the place from things such as the additional homestead exemption to uh, House Bill 7069, which uh, allowed charter schools to come in without having to go through the process of uh, what we would call a special use if those schools were built as something else, maybe the adaptive reuse program. And the tax package, we, had a, we have a tax package where every year, I don't think it happened last year, but it will happen this year where there'll be a reduction in the days that uh, we can take our kids for back to school shopping, the reduction in the commercial leases, and a number of other things that are included in this 180.3 million dollar tax package, as well as the entire budget. As you know, when we go to Tallahassee, and if you don't know, I'll explain it, the only bill that we have to pass when we go to Tallahassee is the budget. That's the reason that this year we went from 60 days to 63 days. And when the budget is finished, you have to have it laid on the table or on our Senate's de on the senators or the, le or the representatives' desk for a 72-hour cooling period. So that's what pushed us into that uh, additional time. Lake Okeechobee discharges. I'll, I'll briefly explain, as you may know, we had a state of emergency for more than 300 days here in the state of Florida and several counties, Palm Beach, Martin, and St. Lucie County with regard to uh, the blue-green algae. And as one of my friends in the legislature, Mr. or Senator Bradley likes to say, the guacamole water, that it sounds funny, but that guacamole water caused a number of our beaches to close. Uh, a number of businesses not to be able to do business in that area and also polluted the area greatly, which of course had an economic impact to our county. So what we have done, we had Senate President Negron who took it as his priority to make sure that there was storage uh, south of the lake. The problem with that originally, there was a plan to purchase 60,000 60, acres to, co to carry 360,000 acre feet of water and that would have an impacted negatively the glades area, which is Del Glade, South Bay, and Pahokee. So the Tri-Cities area, the Tri-Cities area, some of the legislators and the Senate President worked together to mitigate and reduce the impact that would have on the uh, city south of the lake by uh, ending up using land that the, the state already owned to now store 240,000 acre feet and then using the other programs that are part of the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Project to be able to mitigate better so that we can, we can move forward with that. And as you know, we've talked about it. It's been all over the place. People are wondering what's happening. July 3rd was the time that it had to be implemented. That's why we had to go back to, that's not why we went back for, for a special session, but we did go back for part of this to make sure that we finished uh, what was to deal with medical marijuana. 
some of the things uh, that happened with Amendment 2. As you know, medical marijuana, uh, marijuana period, is still a Schedule One drug federally. However, the Department of Justice in 2013 uh, decided that it was not going to prosecute the different states that, that had put rules in place with regard to mar marijuana. Um, the medical marijuana bill that we passed or that the, the citizens voted for with Amendment 2 would exempt qualified patients from being sentenced under the federal guidelines and under the state guidelines, would also exempt physicians who were issuing certification for medical marijuana treatment. Also, we talk about medical marijuana just so people will understand, and we'll talk about this more comprehensively. This is a big bill. It takes more than 10 minutes to go into it, but uh, it goes from seed to sale. So you can't have someone who does not have a distribution uh, facility that hasn't spent or invested millions of dollars into this start up their own MMTCs. And in municipalities, one of the biggest things that you should know and that I'll make known, uh, and it's been in the newspapers already, is that uh, you can ban MMTCs. You cannot come up with regulations that will say where they must go uh, with, outside of the confines of you know, a, a local pharmacy like Walgreens. I mean, if you've, you've got zoning, I'm sure you can say, okay, this is not zoned for this area. However, you can't come in with a set of special regulations specifically related to MMTCs. However, keeping that in mind, you still can not put a medical marijuana treatment facility within 500 feet of a local school or a daycare center. So those are some of the things that you do want to keep in, in mind. Either you can ban it or you have to allow it I think this is something that we'll see again next year. It's a work in progress, but we, I think the, between the legislature and the Department of Health, we had to put something on the books so that we have an, uh, a good way to implement this. Uh, bills that were important, I had a lot of priority bills. We could go into detail, but these are six of the bills that we ended up passing. I want to point out the vessel registration, as I saw in the newspaper today, uh, the Austin and Perry families look like they can or will be suing each other. And, and I think that's a huge uh, tragedy and, and travesty that happened. I work with Representative Mary Lynn Magar this year. She's the representative in the House who carried this piece of legislation. I carried it in the Senate, uh, vessel registration, which reduces the amount of registration fees that one pays uh, on their, their, their vessel, their watercraft, with regard to um, having an electronic, an EPIRB or no something <coughs> recognized by the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration to be able to find these vessels if they're lost at sea. The reason we did this and the reason we pushed this so hard, Senate President Negron, it was one of his priorities as well. He couldn't run it because he's the Senate President. But the idea is we want to save lives, right? At the end of the day, had those young men had something where we could have found them quickly, there is a chance that they'd be here with us today. So by having this, it uh, allows for people to take that extra step, save a few dollars, get an EPIRB on your vessel, and save more than just children, but save anybody who may be lost at sea. And also, I, I, I ran a piece of legislation with uh, Representative Magar with regard to stroke centers. Many people, many of us in here have had people in our families who've been impacted, if not ourselves, by high blood pressure or by, by strokes and this adds acute stroke ready facilities to the list of stroke centers that are available to <coughs> mitigate the impact of people dying from strokes and that's been very, very important to us. In terms of appropriations, uh, I think my office with my team along with uh, our, our lobbyist, Mr. Matt Forrest, we were responsible for bringing more than $26 million back to Palm Beach County. Of course, after the governor came and did his chop of the $10 million, a lot, you know, when you cover the biggest part of Palm Beach County, a lot of that cut out of that $10 million uh, had my name on it as well. But we were able to be successful and bring some great things back to Palm Beach County. Uh, for mental illness, you know, we're still underfunded, underfunded here in Florida with regard to mental illness. I think we're still ranked 49th. But here in Palm Beach County, we've got $500,000 in the budget for the Jerome Golden Health Mental Health Facility on 45th Street in West Palm Beach. We brought funding back for uh, the Loxahatchee River Preserve. What's big for this area is Place of Hope. Uh, we brought $2.9 million in for Place of Hope for, for the Welfare Reorganization uh, Phase 3 program, which is big here. It helps a lot of, lot of um, young men and, and young people 
get back on their or get on their feet and, and move through life. And then, of course, education was important. When we talk about that special session, we don't mention the amount of money that we were able to get put back into the budget from the Senate side uh, for the $9.8 million that we got in for the Life Sciences Building at Florida Atlantic University. Palm Beach Gardens issues. Now, this is what, what is very, very important. And as I know, I, was, uh, I got tipped off by our city clerk as well as our uh, lobbyist, Mr. Forrest, and, and my team member, Mr. Durgan, worked on some of these issues to make sure that we were in the right place. Uh, I worked very well with the League of Cities as well as the Florida, Florida Association of Counties to kind of take our guys on some of the issues that we deal with locally. H07, HB807, and I, I know I had the Senate bill somewhere, the Senate version, that was the practice of substance abuse providers. That's the marketing that we talked about earlier with marketing sober homes. Uh, Representative Hager, as well as Senator Jeff Clemens, had a number of performance standards that would have to be in place so that we wouldn't continue to over-market these sober homes. And if people were using unfair practices to try to get people to come to these sober homes, and as we've seen, there's been a crackdown, uh, that has been put in legislation to kind of stop some of that. Uh, a big one for Palm Beach Gardens was House Bill 867, Senate Bill 596. That's the utilities bill where they can come in or uh, a utility can come in and put a utility, a small wireless facility somewhere. A lot of us want 5G and 4G, but this has been an issue that, of course, the League of Cities was against, Florida Association of Counties was for. This bill was amended here 12 different times. Uh, when it came to us, I saw it when it got on the floor, and I know I talked to you about it. I talked to the League of Cities and a number of people about this piece of legislation. When it first came to us, uh, there was no way that anyone could support it. Uh, they made a number of changes. It was worked down, whittled down. Uh, some, of the, some of the most egregious things were taken out of it. And finally, when it did hit the floor, uh, it was something that most of us could support. It passed on the Senate floor by a vote of 33 to 1. And my good friend, Victor Torres, he was the lone senator who was like, listen, I don't care what they change. It takes away home rule and Senator Torres made sure he was down on that bill. House Bill 221, Transportation Network Companies. As we continue to evolve, we got Uber and Lyft. Uh, this is something that I ended up supporting this year. Uh, previously, I was against supporting this piece of legislation. However, as I become a, 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 a huge supporter and writer of Uber, I, don't, I haven't used Lyft yet, I've found out that many of the young people and the millennials, they live by this. And if, you, if you've known, uh, I know people now who are 26 years old and older who don't even have driver's licenses, and I'm not sure how that works, but a lot of them depend on Uber, and a lot of them are from these metropolitan areas where they can call a car. It's there in five minutes or less, and they can maneuver. So uh, that was something that I thought it was important to support. Public records relating to court fees. As you know, uh, it was happening in the town of Ocean Ridge and a number of places in Palm Beach County where you have somebody going around requesting public records. If they don't get them in time, then they're suing the municipality, and we think that, and we were trying to come up with a way to not block people from getting public records, but if it was downright egregious and someone was trying to do it out of not in good faith, we came up with a piece of legislation that would slow that down and hinder it so we couldn't, we wouldn't continue to uh, lose money from our municipalities when we're short-staffed, especially some of these smaller municipalities, trying to get public records exemptions for someone who's real intent is basically to sue the municipality, whether it be the county or the city or whatever municipality it is. So we supported that. We voted in favor of that. Economic programs, 5501, as you know, this is one of the things that we went back to. Uh, originally, the House and Senate, the House had no funding in there in the budget for uh, what we call Enterprise Florida or Visit Florida. And a part of that was because the House felt that um, and, and I should say the Speaker of the House, more specifically, felt that these funds were not being appropriated fairly and there was no watchdog over them. And in our special session, we brought that level of funding back up to what it needs to be, both places around $70 million for both House, both Visit Florida and Enterprise Florida, so we can continue to do the good work that we do. We had Kelly Small Ridge from here, right in Palm Beach County, come up and speak to 
our speaker several times with regard to Enterprise Florida and Visit Florida and the good things that the Business Development Board is doing here. And as you know, um, North, North Palm Chamber of Commerce or Palm Beach North Chamber has been doing a lot of good things in this area that it's really helped to turn Palm Beach North around and we've become what we call an, an economic em, uh, engine. One of the biggest bills that we ended up facing uh, was this House Bill 70, I'm sorry, House Joint Resolution 7105, the increased homestead exemption. And what that does is what many people don't understand, and I'm just going to, um, I'll give you the Reader's Digest version of it, right? If your home is worth more than $125,000, then after this goes on the ballot, then if it passes, um, then you will be able to get an additional homestead exemption. The problem with this is that our counties and municipalities are going to suffer. Now, the bill, and I debated this with my uh, good friend, Senator Tom Lee, uh, it holds out, I believe, 29 counties from being a part of this. So 29 counties will not be affected by this, meaning that they will vote on it. But they're, they have no, no reason or they have no reason why not to vote for it because their counties won't be affected. That's nearly, we have 67 counties in the state of Florida. That's almost half, well, at least a third of our counties that will get a chance to vote on something that doesn't affect them. And I thought that maybe we should do a carve out. If your county is not affected, then you shouldn't be able to vote on this because that vote counts in the total of the 60% that we have to get to in order for this to pass. What it does is if your house is between 100 thousand and 125,000 you get an additional $25,000 tax exemption that's that third level what they call the fifth diagram uh, however if your house falls between that range let's say your house is worth 124,000 you may vote on this when it comes up for election when it comes on the ballot and say "Ooh, I get another exemption but guess what you you fall you don't fall outside of the 125,000 range so you really don't get that get that exemption. We already have two exemptions here in the state of Florida where you get up to $50,000. This would be a third exemption which is going to cost I, I didn't I don't remember how much it's going to cost uh, Palm Beach Gardens. But I do know that it would be an impact where we end up reducing services or we'd have to maybe do another increase in taxes somewhere and people we the legislature have taken this, which is big preemption, and we said that, you know what, we want to reduce people's taxes. Preemption again, but then it forces you, the local officials, to have to raise them somewhere, and you would take the brunt, blunt or the brunt of really what was uh, done by the legislature, our decision. So those are some of the biggest issues that we face. Those are some of Palm Beach Gardens issues that I wanted to hit on. Uh, I want to show you also who's responsible and who's important to get some of the things done that are necessary in my office. Uh, my legislative assistants, all three of them are right there. You have Delano Allen, who is at another event for me. He was earlier at the, what we call the Jack and Jill event with the mayor. <laughs> and you've got Mr. Ben Durgan, who's right here with me right now, who will help to put this slideshow together and also uh, got some of the information for us with regard to some of these pieces of legislation, some of the bills that we passed this year and jogged and refreshed my memory as well as Ms. Mary Dozier, who's usually at the office home front taking care of the business in the office. Also important, you can also find us on, or find me on Twitter and Facebook and Senator, Senator Powell, P-O-W, on Instagram. But more importantly, when you have legislative issues and legislative questions, you can call my office at 561 650 Six eight eight zero. I'm not there during the daytime most of the time, but you can find one of these three smiling faces. And look, they're all smiling. That means they're waiting for you to call <laughs> so they can help you with regard to any of the issues dealing with a state agency, dealing with legislation, or dealing with uh, getting funds appropriated to your community. And now I'm glad to be back in Palm Beach Gardens. I'm home where my alma mater is, and I'm ready to ask, well, answer questions, take comments, or just general conversation from our beautiful and wonderful council. Thank you all so much. Well, Bobby, thank you for your presentation. And by doing this um, slideshow, it is also everyone who's watching it at home will get to 
really see your phone number, really see your face, <laughs> and really see your staff. So thank you. Do I have any comments or questions from the rest of the council? Michelle. Thank you. There we go. I just wanted to congratulate you on the award that you received from the Florida League of City from the Florida League of Cities last month. Thank you so much. It was a. Uh, it's really an honor, and I will tell you, it's more so my team and the work that they do uh, that allows me to be recognized. But it was pretty good. I was trying to figure out how to be uh, at the county convention center and down south for the League of Cities, as both entities uh, decided that it'd be good to give my office or give me an award on the same day. So. I'm really, really strong with regard to a lot of our local municipalities, uh, a lot of our home rule. As an urban planner, I think it's important to recognize um, our, our municipalities first, and we, we try to do that as best we can. Any questions for Bobby? Comments? Matthew? Mark? Thank you. Well, thank you all so Senator much for Powell, having me. Senator Powell, thank you so much for being here today. I'm excited, so thank you so much for having me and enjoy the rest of your week and the rest of the council meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Roth, thank you for being here also. And Matt Forrest, thank you. All right. Next on our agenda is Garden Cups Sponsors. I just want to know, is it more than last year? A uh, little less. A little less, but we'll talk about why. Okay. Uh, good evening, Council. Charlotte Przensky, for the record. Um, I'm here this evening to share with you the wonderful results of our 2017 Gardens Cup and to recognize those people who made it happen. Uh, before we go into all of that, I want to recognize the two people that are standing with me, Sherry and Justin. I'm really just the person who gets to stand here and talk about all the wonderful things that goes on at the golf course, but these two people make it happen day in and day out. So um, I'm glad you're both here and uh, I'm glad you're both at the course because without them and without Gabe, who's on father duty tonight, so he's not here, and Pat, our wonderful superintendent, our golf course wouldn't be in the condition that it does and gets the play that it does without staff like this. So. Um, the 2017 Gardens Cup, we had 123 players play this year. Uh, it was a wonderful Saturday morning, but it took a tremendous amount. Anybody need the phone number again? No. <laughs> Let me grab that off. There we go. Okay. Um, it was a wonderful Saturday morning. Thank you, Mayor, for going around and playing golf with everyone. It was a great day. Um, but this year was very special. We've been doing the Gardens Cup for a couple of years now, and as you know, we do this tournament to raise funds for your city spirit team. The spirit team is a very dedicated group, volunteer group of city staff members who do the wonderful things to recognize all of the work that your city staff does. They run uh, breakfasts, recognition, holiday events, they're the cheer team, they do things even for charities in our community, but as you know, they don't receive funding from the city budget. So this tournament is very important to what they do. And this year was special because now that we're in our third or fourth year, everyone came together and made it a fabulous event. So even though it's a little bit less, the quality this year was a little bit better. Our prizes were better. Everything that we did was just another notch up because our goal was to make it to be very similar as the Mayor's Cup each year, the quality, so we attract people. So um, volunteers, I'm going to ask you to stand and be recognized. Um, these are the people who worked. We had Alana, Ann, Lily, Candace, Danny, Dawn, Deborah, and if you're not standing, please do. Uh, Izzy, Joanne, Kumra, Mary, Norm, Sean, Tim Ford, Wendy, Daniel, Jen Nelly, Brooke, Barb, Brandon, Teresa, Lauren, Crystal. All of these people worked very hard to make this event happen. And I want to tell you the golf staff appreciate everything you did this year because it was a wonderful year. So thank you very much. Okay, and if I could invite the mayor down to help us give out some certificates. What we'd like to do is recognize our sponsors. Um, each year this event, uh, 
we raise in the neighborhood of just over $13,000. This year was $13,900. That ranges from our presenting sponsor, which I'd like to call up Mr. Murphy from the uh, Palm Beach Gardens Police Foundation. They have been our presenting sponsor since the beginning. And I think he's got a few words to say before he gets his plaque. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, on behalf of the Palm Beach Gardens Police Foundation, we are honored, of course, each year to be the presenting sponsor of this event. We recognize that while we are closely linked with the police department, we recognize that a lot of the fine efforts that our police officers do in crime prevention and crime solving is very closely linked to the efforts and the problem solving efforts of the city employees who work in the various different departments. So our recognition of this event is to thank those people who work with our police department and work throughout the city to make sure our city is the finest city in South Florida in which to live. Thank you. And if you could stay there, we're going to bring everyone up. Maybe come right here. Um, our next sponsor um, is a gentleman who has been with us and always answers my call when I ask him. Um, Mr. Tom Carnes, he is representing the Gardens Mall and the PGA Corridor Association. Tom, thank you so much. He does answer the call every time. Not only do they uh, write a check as a sponsor, but they also give us our grand prizes, which were $100 gift certificates to, uh, for the winners. So uh, next up, oh, wait, one more, PGA Corridor Association. Awesome. <laughs> our next up is another gentleman who every time we ask is there, and we love him for it, and it's our very own city attorney, Max Lohman. Come on down, Max. Did Tom leave? Where'd Tom go? Yeah, no, Mr. Murphy. Come on, you got to stay up. Yeah, we're going to get a big picture. Okay, next one. And again, another group that always answers the call for us. Uh, there every time we ask, and I believe Andrew with the Honda Classic is here, and we'd like to recognize him. And then another one who's been with us since the inception, and uh, it's BBX Capital Real Estate, also a member of the corridor, and we have Blaze with us tonight. One of our newest sponsors, and we are so glad that they came on board, and they do a lot for our city. Uh, they are highly involved with our green market. This is the first year they've been with us with the uh, Gardens Cup. I'd like to recognize Megan with the Gardens Medical Center. <laughs> and a few others, which I don't believe are representative this night. Uh, Alan Norton and Blue, who uh, work with our city and our human resources department and the Palm Beach Gardens Youth Athletic Association. Did anyone? No, I, I, they didn't answer. Um, they were a new sponsor also this year. So with that, what I'd like to do, Sherry and Justin, if you could do the honors. This year, our donation is $15,697 to the spirit team. And if I could ask all of the volunteers to come up, stand with our council and sponsors and the big check so we can get a really nice pictures. Volunteers, come on up. Izzy, don't be shy. Come on in. If we can get our sponsors. Thank you all to our sponsors. We'll see you all next year in May. Thank you.
Now we have recognition of the Fire Explorers Post number 705 for their accomplishments in the 2017 Fire Explorer Firematics. Anybody coming up? Are we just recognizing you? <laughs> okay, great job. <laughs> Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council. For the record, Deputy Chief Sean Brodell. Let me get this thing squared away here a second. It's my pleasure to be here tonight presenting to you an amazing group of young, dedicated, highly motivated. Uh, it's near and dear to my heart. They're, it's, uh, they're with the Boy Scouts of America, post 705. Um, they've been around for a long time. Mr. Thurman, I'm going to give a quick introduction at some point here, and he's, he's probably going to hate me for it, but I'm going to do it. Um, they're attached to us through the Boy Scouts 705 Explorer post. Um, and they're in the Fire Explorer program, very similar to the police program that we have. And we, we love our youth enrichment programs that we have in the fire department, and we continue to support them. We ask, when we ask you to continue to support them, I know you will, and we thank you for that. Um, so this group rec recently competed in a regional competition that we held at our fire station 63 on North Lake Boulevard. And the event consisted of uh, multiple disciplines that career firefighters are asked to do, and they train on it throughout the year. They put a lot of hard work, a lot of time, a lot of effort into it. And this year we had two teams from Palm Beach Gardens Fire Rescue and two teams from Port St. Lucie Fire Rescue compete with a total of 50 competitors. So some of the uh, disciplines were hose deployment, hose roll, running hose, midnight drill, the barrel push, and uh, it gives me a uh, great honor to congratulate Palm Beach Gardens Team A. They set a new record on the barrel push of 17 seconds in the Boy Scout organization, so we're very happy for that. Now let me get to some of these numbers here because it is a little confusing. So Palm Beach Gardens Team A had three first place finishes, two second place finishes, this allowed them to take first place in the overall event, which gives us the traveling trophy, which we stole from Palm Beach or uh, Boca Raton Fire Rescue this year. So we have it for the, for the next year. We're super excited about that. So congratulations. Yes, we're going down. Palm Beach Gardens Team B had one second place finish and four third place finishes. Overall, they scored third in the overall event. So real quick, I want to introduce Mr. Thurman, uh, and he's probably going to be upset at me for this because he's, he's a kind, humble man that's not with this. But Mr. Thurman is the father of Sean Thurman. Uh, Sean was a career firefighter for the city, and unfortunately he passed away a few years ago from cancer. Uh, shortly after that, Mr. Thurman passionately became involved with this program, and he's never looked back. He's also, a, I believe, a, a council advisor also for the overall Boy Scouts in the area, and he has done amazing things with this program. So uh, there's two others, Captain Pierce, who is not here, and T.J. Hewitt, who's also a, an advisor and a career firefighter for us who came up through the Explorer program. So these programs, the, the youth that come out of them, they blossom, they end up leaving us at some point. Some stay at home and try to keep them at home. But most of the, the uh, individuals that come through the program end up hired somewhere in the state as a firefighter paramedic. So these are the programs that the city continues to support, and we thank you guys for that, Mr. Ferris, Council, for the continued support. I know small investments today make great dividends in the future, and we, we love, love having these programs as a part of the fire rescue and throughout the city. I'm also a resident, and I see two young kids coming up, and I, I love the youth enrichment, and that's what brought me from Jupiter. I was a Jupiter boy forever and ever, and I moved here about seven years ago. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce everybody up here um, by name. We'll have you guys line up. You can see all their bright, shiny trophies. We'll have the mayor come down and take a photo with us. Um, let me get to the names here. It's on page three. So we have Wyatt Kinzer. Michaela Holder, Ryan Pryor, Jacob Bockstrom, Hunter Rich, John Sweeney, Sky Underwood, Joseph Johnson, Ethan Travers, Evan Travers, 
James Barca, Daniel Allen, Jackson Brandt, Ryan Stanko, Michael Curry, Carson Kenzer, Christian Ulrich, Tommy Gogarty, I think I got it right, Tommy, Devin Jacobs. We just want to say thank you guys on your accomplishments and congratulations. Now, my eyes were playing tricks on me, and I went right by recognition of the Stroke Awareness Team. I apologize. So now I'd like to have recognition of the Stroke Awareness Team. For those of you keeping score, that's item C on the agenda. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Members, City Manager Ferris. Thank you for allowing me to come before you tonight. Uh, to recognize some community partnerships that we've established uh, in the field and in our community. Uh, a little background about the uh, presentations tonight uh, about Stroke Awareness Month. Uh, over the past several years, we've identified a trend among stroke patients within our city. And that trend was that patients were delaying calling 911 when the onset of symptoms occurred. And in 2015, we actually saw an average onset of symptoms to 911 of being 112 minutes. Now, for those of you that may or may not know, every minute that goes by, you could potentially lose 2 million brain cells, leading to permanent disabil uh, disability or death. So time is important. We identified this trend, and we decided to come up with a, an aggressive campaign to go out to the community and educate citizens of the signs and symptoms of stroke, and to hopefully bring that number down. 2016, we saw a decrease to 83 minutes. So that was a pretty significant change and decrease in time of people waiting uh, to call 911 and, and get us there to help them out. Now, this couldn't have been done solely by Palm Beach Gardens Fire Rescue. We did it in partnership with some surrounding hospitals and some individuals. And that's why tonight I come before you and people joining us here and the audience to present a, a token of our appreciation to uh, some agencies and individuals. So I'd like to start off uh, with our neighboring hospital, Palm Beach Gardens Medical Center, and accepting it on their behalf, Carrie Johnson, the CNO. You can go ahead and just stay up. We'll take a picture at the end. Um, also, I'd like to say uh, to Rick Nagler, the COO of St. Mary's Medical Center, come on up. Uh, Dr. Talkett, Palm Beach Gardens Medical Center, neurologist, come on up. Tiffany Trim, Neuroscience Manager at St. Mary's Medical Center. And receiving two awards tonight, Megan Dunn, come on up. I'd like to thank everyone who uh, helped this year's Stroke Awareness Month uh, be a huge success. 
we hope that at the end of the year we will see an even more of a decrease in that delay of activating 911 and we thank you uh, for your support and your involvement with us in this partnership. So if I could ask the mayor to come on down, the council members, we'll take a picture. We should just stay down. Yeah. Along with along with the stroke presentation that we've just completed, uh, American Heart Association is also here, and American Stroke Association for a presentation. Um, I'd also like to to bring up my medical director, Dr. Shepke, for this presentation. And uh, representing the American Heart Association and American Stroke Association tonight is Beth Marolados. Hopefully I got that right. Jeffrey Walker and Melissa Mickel. Good evening. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Palm Beach Gardens Fire Rescue has received the 2017 American Heart Association's Mission Lifeline EMS Gold Plus Award. This award recognizes its commitment and success in implementing specific quality improvement measures for the treatment of patients who suffer a severe heart attack known as a STEMI. That's ST elevation myocardial infarction. Palm Beach Garden Fire Rescue provided a percentage of adult out-of-hospital cardiac arrest patients with sustained return of spontaneous circulation for at least 20 minutes until they arrived at an emergency department. Additionally, they successfully positioned a 12-lead EKG prior to hospital arrival. Every year, almost 300,000 people experience a STEMI, a type of heart attack caused by a complete blockage of blood flow to the heart that requires timely treatment. To prevent death, it's critical to restore blood flow as quickly as possible, either by surgically opening the blocked vessel or by giving clot-busting medication. Emergency medical system providers are vital to the success of Mission Lifeline. EMS agencies provide education in STEMI identification and access to a 12-lead EKG machine and follow protocol derived from the American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology guidelines. The correct tools and training allow EMS providers to rapidly identify STEMI, promptly notify the medical center, and trigger early response from the awaiting hospital personnel. The American Heart Association would like to extend its sincere thanks to you, Mayor Marino, to all of our city commissioners, to the Fire and Rescue Chief, Keith Breyer, to the Division Chief of Emergency Medical Services, Corey J. Bissett, to the EMS Medical Director, Dr. Ken Shepke, and of course, to the Palm Beach um, Gardens Fire Rescue. For the hundreds and really even thousands of lives saved each and every year, thank you to our city commissioners for providing the funding and processes in place to allow our Palm Beach Gardens Fire Rescue to serve the citizens of Palm Beach Gardens. 
congratulations on a job well done and for this incredible life-saving work that you do. Thank you. I want to thank the American Heart Association for this award, and, um, but I want to recognize that this is a team effort starting with the education provided by the community, by fire rescue, by the hospital, some of the physicians and nurses that you've seen here, by the 911 dispatchers who rapidly recognize those in cardiac arrest and having symptoms of a heart attack, to our EMTs and, and, and paramedics who there are none better in the country and to the fine nurses, doctors, medics, PAs, nurse practitioners that work in the area hospitals that, that receive these patients. Uh, this is truly something that Palm Beach Gardens should be proud of. I, I can tell you that we are literally one of the best in the country on both cardiac arrest and heart attack or STEMI care, as well as stroke care. And I actually lecture on this topic around the country to show others how we do it right here at home because we are considered a national best practice. So we should be very proud here locally. Thank you for the award. Okay. Next, under announcements and presentation, recognition of Sergeant Jeff Sewell. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council and staff. For the record, my name is Paul Rogers, and I'm the Major with the Palm Beach Gardens Police Department in charge of our Special Operations Bureau. On Thursday, May 25th, 2017, Sergeant Jeffrey Sewell was awarded the annual Community Policing Award by the American Society for Industrial Security. Sergeant Sewell was in competition to receive this award against community policing officers and deputies from law enforcement agencies in Palm Beach County, Martin, St. Lucie, and Indian River. So there was a lot, of, a lot of competition with this. For 18 years, the city of Palm Beach Gardens has embraced the practice of crime prevention through environmental design, which is also known as SEPTED, and has incorporated this uh, practice into all new redevelopment and construction throughout the city. Sergeant Sewell has taken ownership of the SEPTED program and has grown it into new levels and was recently, uh, has been recently demonstrated with the revision and implementation of a brand new citywide comprehensive ordinance. So Sergeant Sewell has also assisted neighboring jurisdictions with reviewing plans, modifying their ordinances, and answering technical questions. While it's nearly impossible to measure the amount of crime which has been prevented, crime statistics provide an insight that the program is working. The police department has seen a 40% decrease in commercial robberies and a 17% decrease in non-residential burglaries in recent years. As our city continues to grow, Sergeant Sewell's experience, training, and attention to detail will develop and redevelop large crime-resistant commercial centers and residential communities, improving the quality of life for the residents and visitors to our city. Ladies and gentlemen, Sergeant Sewell. Good evening. For the record, Jeff Sewell. 
I just want to say that without the teamwork and the partnership with the uh, with Natalie Crowley's uh, Planning and Zoning Development Review Committee team, uh, this wouldn't be possible. So thank you very much. I want to extend a thank you out to all the members from the planners, development compliance, to the uh, city forester, chief building official, engineering department, and the fire department. Thank you very much for, for working with me. I love coming to work every single day to, to partner with you. And I also want to say thank you to my wife. I didn't get a chance to do that during <laughs> when my first recognition for the award at, with ASIF. <laughs> thank you very much uh, for being. <laughs> I just want to say that she's very patient with me while I pursue my passion and uh, putting extra hours in with the uh, station. So thank you very much, honey. <laughs> uh, again, this award, um, I'll gladly keep it in my office, but to be honest, it belongs to all of us with the DRC staff members. So thank you very much, ma'am, and thank you, Chief. Thank you, city staff members. Thank you so very much, and thank you for your dedication. <laughs> with us, we can all so get up and come, come on! <laughs> we'll do it one last time! We like to see you every day. You want a picture of us? I enjoy this part of the meeting. Okay, so now we are on to items of resident interest and board and committee reports. Rochelle, I'll start with you. Anything to report? Is, uh, uh, a busy month in, uh, Token, turn your mic on. It, it was a busy month. We had, what, um, the chamber breakfast, uh, League of Cities event, and um, a couple of uh, ribbon cuttings in the uh, city, so. Yeah, Matthew? Okay, I met with the officers of Palm Beach State College and took a tour. I attended the Chamber of Commerce, um, State of the Chamber a breakfast, attended the NCNC meeting, which is near and dear to my heart. I attended the uh, North County Business Expo and also the Chamber of Commerce CEO connection with uh, Tim Burke from the Palm Beach Post. Thank you. Carl? For the record, Carl Woods, 4908 Grassleaf Drive, Palm Beach Gardens. <laughs> I, I, anybody want a picture with you? You only get three minutes, no. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm totally gonna go a different directions with items on public interest, and I hope all of, all of you guys will follow me. Um, and I actually wrote down my thoughts. So, um, hi everybody, and again, and welcome to our meeting. Um, I'm going to go a different direction with items on public interest. Uh, I get that public wants to know what the council has accomplished in the last 30 days, but I feel you also want to know what your city employees and your city has done. Uh, the meetings that we go to monthly, rather it be Chamber of Commerce, League of Cities, MPO Board, North Lake Task Force, and so on, are meetings and decisions that uh, shape the distant future and help us make decisions as we go. I'd like to start by recognizing outstanding city employees for their efforts, even though we had an abundancy of that tonight. We normally don't have all this. Um, efforts in what they have done for the community 
and what's happening in our city now. Our employers are doing so many, gr so many great things for our community and it goes unrecognized, but not anymore. Some of these unmentionables, I'm sure you will just, once we give some presentations, you're just going to, wow, that really happens in this city. Tonight, for the first time as we go forward with this in effort to bring each item to life, I will try and have a short, short PowerPoint presentation as I read the letters that have been generated to either council or the city manager. I have requested of the city manager to have department heads pay special attention, as I know they already do, to outstanding efforts by employees or citizens and try and have some pictures if possible. Of course, I would love to mention all the employees and their efforts, but I will focus on the ones that stand out and truly feel these are items of public interest. But it doesn't stop here. I think an item for public interest is everything that's going on in the city. How is the golf course clubhouse going? How's Alton Project moving along? What about the bridge on Elm Street? These are things we can visually see but are not seen by everybody. It's not too hard to report monthly on progress on what the city is. Um, and for example, I'm just going to, Alicia, you can bring that one up. Um, here is a, a call that I received. On June 29th, I received an email from the president of Thurston Association and PG National. Her name's Anita Carbone, requesting, the situation, requesting assistance with a situation with renters in the neighborhood who moved out and left numerous plastic bags full of garbage, including food, drinks, so on, in the street. They also left it as shown, boxes full of goods, toys, furniture, athletic equipment, other items, and so on. And what you can't see in this picture is all of the perishables that were left out, and um, they requested the uh, waste management to come and pick it up. So um, I received and wanted to share the nice thank you and email received from Mrs. Carbone, recognize the city's prompt response and action regarding this mess. Now I have her official letter as I gave it to the mayor and the city manager, and she, I mean, she was insistent on this was such a, a large problem, and she called me and emailed me, and Obviously, within a minute, Jack was the a acting city manager. I called up Jack, and he went, no problem, Carl. And we got Dave on the phone, and this was the, the weekend before the 4th of July. So they thought they were going to have an absolute mess um, within this area for a whole weekend. So just to sum up her letter, she says, I know the, f I know the following were involved in actual hands-on cleanup project. Alphabetically, this homeowners association would l like to recognize Henry McKenzie, um, Scott Harvey, Robin Smith, Stephen Vesey, Dan Whittock, Lewis Johnson was the operation manager and got it right into physical and cleanup, as did Dan Whittock and the other gentleman who I did not catch, but his name is above. Anyway, they were focused on eliminating the foul stench and that left the debris over. It was pretty nasty, and their mission was to sanitize the area, and they certainly did. So that's just one example um, of one thing and Alicia if we can go on to the next one thank you I don't know if you guys can read this letter but um, it's a letter to the chief of police Stephen Stepp on June 20th the city's police department received a letter from the fire chief Robert F Hochurl of the city of Fort Lauderdale fire department rescue to say thank you and recognition and formally come in offer officer Daniel Abrera officer Abrera was first to to arrive on scene of a three vehicle accident late in the evening, May 17, 2017. Fort Lauderdale firefighter Sovins, Vince Sovins, Castley, who was on his way home after working an overtime shift, shift, was struck from behind by another vehicle at a high rate of speed, which sent him into another vehicle westbound lane, where his vehicle struck again, causing his vehicle to spin and roll over onto the roof, partially trapping Vince underneath. This violent accident ruptured the full tank. Officer Abrera was first to arrive on scene. He crawled underneath an overturned, overturned vehicle to ACES, ACES, rendered aid, administered supportive care and encouragement to firefighter Castelli until Palm Beach County and West Palm Beach firefighters arrived. Firefighter Castelli was extricated and in critical condition with severe spinal injury. He was airlifted to St. Mary Hospital where he were for the first several weeks and now has a long road of recovery and rehabilitation ahead of him. He has left St. Mary's 
for the Shepherd Center spinal cord injury and Rehabil rehabilitation hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. To quote the section of the fire chief poacher's letter, Officer Abrera demonstrated extraordinary courage, commitment, compassion, and without regard for his own personal safety, he crawled over, he crawled under an overturned vehicle in hazardous and flammable environment to render aid to vents until relieved by the fire rescue. Therefore, because of Officer Daniel Abrera's heroic actions, please extend our sincere gratitude, thanks, and appreciation to him in keeping with his highest traditions of the fire services. He should be formally commended and recognized for his outstanding and conspicuous service. Officer Daniel Abrera went above and beyond the call of duty. His credit to the City of Palm Beach Gardens Police Department, Palm Beach County, and the State of Florida law enforcement agencies across the nation, and he should be commended for a job well done. So I'm going to start um, doing things like that. Of course, I know it's important that we share how many meetings that we go to, and I encourage my other council members to, to kind of spice it up um, letters of public interest because there's a lot of things going on um, in the city, and I just want to move this direction with my little time. Still keep it short so we're not going too long. And uh, I think we have to wait. I make up for all. Yeah, I know you you do a good job at that. But uh, these are a couple. This is our very first time doing it, and I hope to continue with this with some PowerPoint presentations, and and hopefully it'll get better, and we'll let you guys really know what's going on within the city as well. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Mark. Well, thanks, Carl. I think that's important to know that at all of our residents, um, we do get emails, and we do want to make sure that you all know that we are available, accessible for anything that happens. And, uh, you know, we read them, and, and I'm glad, Carl, that you brought it up so that everyone knows what a great job our, resi our city staff can do for our residents. And it's not us, it's them, and that's what a great city does. So. Uh, going back to some of the boring ways of, of re <laughs> reporting what we did, uh, the city did have a nice hurricane preparedness event here uh, back on June 8th. Um, Maria and I were here for that. That was great. Um, NCNC was always, always good to be a part of that, the business in your backyard at the Homewood Suites. I did miss the Beeline workshop, but I am interested to hear uh, if we have, uh, when, that, when that becomes a little bit more available, to hear more about what happened there. Uh, I did get a chance to spend a few hours with Chief Breyer and tour the fire station, so thank you for that. That was a good experience to see um, the camaraderie that uh, our fire medics have in all the different departments. And, yes, we did go to a ribbon cutting at Swimtastic, and I think that was really great because, um, you know, small mom-and-pop businesses is what really makes a community in a city uh, special, and that's what we have in the city, and it was great to see a young family kind of building a business with their passion to have a, a, a swim school for young children. So it always breaks our heart when you read something in the paper about a child that, uh, you know, falls in a pool and doesn't know how to swim. So amazingly here in Florida that happens and our children don't know how to swim. So this was a great, great uh, small business, and I hope that they have great success. Thank you. Well, it was a busy month, and... I attended over 20 municipal, county, statewide meetings, business openings and recognitions, and city events. And as you've heard, some of those would include the Palm Beach North Chamber Annual State of the Chamber, the Metropolitan Planning Organization Board Meeting, which I would like to do a shout out to Natalie and Mike Morrow. Um, we had a big discussion about I-95 and North Lake. It was a key discussion. and. Natalie and Mike were very instrumental in convincing FDOT to make a, the redesign as simple and concise as possible. The impact on businesses has been tremendously reduced from the original proposal. So I thank you. That was hard work. Well done. Kudos to you all. Um, Palm Beach County League of Cities, District 1 Luncheon Board Meeting, General Membership Meeting. But a common theme with all of those meetings was, was the legislation that has passed concerning sober homes and medical marijuana. So. Uh, Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council, I know we're going to have a presentation later, but there were, uh, was also a presentation uh, about FPNL's 10-year power plant site plan and options for conservation, and I believe it's actually going to lead to a meeting with the city about some solar plants we may, may be able to uh, incorporate. And uh, actually, County Commissioner Hal Valache discussed the GL Homes land swap issue. So interesting things happen in these meetings. As Mark said, we had the weather the storm event. I'd like to thank our staff who came out and manned booths and 
handed things out and our sponsors also. Uh, we couldn't do it without you or the sponsors. Thank you very much. Um, Board of County Commissioners meeting. Uh, you may have read it in the paper. Members of our Parks and Rec staff for both the city and the county and I presented the district park plan and the commission was overwhelmingly in support of the development of the park. Also met with Scripps Research along with many local elected officials and the discussion of incubator space was a top priority along with the pairing of technology and innovation companies with bioscience for future expansion. Funding has changed and Scripps along with other bioscience companies need to find more creative ways to fund their projects and, and find support staff and space. Um, I'd also like to do a shout out to Chief Step for the NCNC meeting presentation. He was very informative uh, and he, worked very, he works very well with other uh, law enforcement agencies in the area and also nationwide. And one of the interesting statistics from the chief is that there is less crime in Palm Beach Gardens now than, than in the 1980s and the population has more than tripled since then. And I'd also like to say thank you to the chief for meeting with some parents and new drivers, 16-year-olds, a friend of mine came up to me and said, is it possible for me to have, to have Chief Step talk to my 16-year-old and scare him straight? <laughs> so thank you for doing that, Chief. I, I, you're accommodating our, our constituents, and that's a wonderful thing to do. But he was also very impressed with the Tactical Center and your thoroughness and your patience. So thank you very much. Chief, I got a 16-year-old coming up on a driver's license, so I'll be sure to have you. <laughs> Chief, I got a 26-year-old that still can't drive. Oh my gosh, look what I started. <laughs> um, talking about the Beeline and North Lake Boulevard workshop, um, I think we left the workshop with more questions than answers, so there will be another one of those in the future. Um, I know they said they didn't want to, but I think they're going to have to because there were way too many unanswered questions. Um, you all know we have a speakers bureau here and the residents of Paloma had asked for us to come and speak so I was uh, happy to attend and talk about I-95 and Central Boulevard. Also I'd like to do another shout out to the fire explorers because they did a presentation at station one and Sarah Peters, thank you Sarah for, for putting that in the paper. Um, we have much to be proud of with our, our explorers. They in less than two hours raised almost $2,000 in support of the families of the two slain uh, AMR medics by having a bake sale at two public locations. And it's very heartwarming to see how these kids just knew they needed to do something and they got it done. And I know Andrew George from the Honda Classic was here and left and I do wanted to say that they <coughs> continue to be one of the biggest supporters of, of our local agencies in our community and they re recently did their check presentation at Marisol. So Andrew, you're gone, but thank you. And yes, we did all the ribbon cuttings, the Lime Cafe, Jupiter Medical Center, Urgent Care Facility, and the expansion of Crossmatch. I'd like to thank these companies for making an investment in our city and also the people that are working here and living here that are finding jobs here. It's very important to us. We also extended a welcome to the new CEO of Palm Beach Gardens Medical Center, Diane Goldenberg. And I'd like to do another thank you to them because they are a major sponsor of all things Palm Beach Gardens, including the Green Market. I'm done. That was my list. And Carl, great idea. Liked it. Thank you all for your participation monthly, month after month. We do go out into the community. We do listen to the public. We do bring, invite the public here. These are, are wonderful things to do. And speaking of inviting the public here, we now have comments from the public for items not on the agenda. If you haven't submitted a request, please do so now. I had two cards. Uh, Mr. Tom Carnes. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, City Manager, City Attorney. Uh, my name is Tom Carnes, 3101 PGA Boulevard. Uh, I'm here to say a few brief words uh, regarding the PGA Quarter Association. Uh, you've heard it all before, but our goal is to uh, protect and enhance what has been done on uh, PGA Boulevard and uh, to promote PGA Boulevard as the finest business quarter in South Florida, in, in fact, in all of Florida. A <coughs> um, couple of things I'd, I'd like to take care of first. I see that 
that the evaluation of the city manager is, uh, is on tonight's agenda. And uh, on behalf of the business corridor, the PGA Corridor Association, I'd like to give a uh, two thumbs up to uh, Ron Ferris. He always does a great job. He's always more than willing to come over and uh, meet with our board at our board meetings, explain to us what's uh, going on in the city, answer our questions, and solicit uh, any uh, comments that we might have. He does, he does a fabulous job doing that. Um, I'm a little, uh, re oh, we, and we have a program coming up on uh, September 13th at 7.30 at the uh, Embassy Suites. So don't go to the wrong place because usually it's at the Marriott, but this one's at the Embassy Suites. And the title of that is Mobility Around the Gardens. So some of the things you brought up, I'm sure will be, by that time, will be refreshed. Uh, Mayor Marino is going to be uh, the uh, moderator, and Natalie Crowley will be one of the, uh, the panel, as well as uh, representatives from the Transportation, uh, County Transportation uh, Authority and Treasure Coast Regional Planning. So please, that's September 13th, 7.30 at the, uh, the embassy suites. Um, now, I, I gotta say, I'm, I'm kind of remiss. I'm, I'm very familiar with the, uh, the police explorers and all the great things that they do. And, you know, I'm, I'm not as familiar uh, with the, uh, the fire explorers. But if they can, and it sounds like they are with the awards they're winning, uh, get up anywhere near where the police explorers are and the awards they win, it is just great. What a great program. And you're, you're kind of grooming these people to come up to the police department, the fire department, their local residents. Hopefully they'll stay here and just, you know, serve as backup and, and replacements for, uh, for those uh, you know, police and fire department uh, members that are, that are leaving. Um, so congratulations to them. Um, has there been, did I not get the memo or something? This is, I think, the and I've probably been to many, many of these councilmen. I've never seen everyone have a necktie on before, and I really feel like I'm kind of underdressed here. <laughs> so did everyone know you're gonna take that many pictures tonight? Is that Don't the they look new, good? It's the new guard. <laughs> <laughs> so and congratulations to the police department on the, uh, the decrease in the crime. That is, that's always uh, great to hear. Um, and that's about it. See you in September. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Tom. And my last card is from Tom Murphy. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Members. For the record, Tom Murphy, President of the Palm Beach Gardens Police Foundation. Uh, in keeping with the theme that we've had tonight of golf and explorers and youth programs, et cetera, I wanted to remind you that each year the Police Foundation does run an annual golf tournament that was used to entirely fund the Palm Beach Gardens Police Explorer Program, as well as a number of other youth programs within the city of Palm Beach Gardens. We've recently signed our contract for this year's tournament. It'll be held on October the 28th at the PGA Resort on both the Champion Course, which is of course the home of the Honda Classic, as well as the Fazio Course, which was recently redone and expertly designed for an enjoyable day of golf. So we have options for players of every skill level at that tournament. The tournament is preceded the night before the tournament by a cocktail reception sponsored by our dear friends in the Gardens Mall called the Brio Tuscan Grill. And this is our 10th annual Palm Beach Gardens Police Foundation Golf Tournament. So this is, and it has become a premier golf event, charity event within the county of Palm Beach. So therefore it is always in great demand and in fact it always sells out. So I would encourage you and all of our residents and anyone else, business people who wants to play in that tournament to sign up as soon as you can so you make sure you get yourself a foursome. And you can do that by going to golf.pbgpf.org or by calling my office at 799-4440. We look forward to seeing you all there. We hope you get in in time to book yourself a foursome and we expect to have an outstanding day and raise a lot of money for both the youth programs and the Palm Beach Gardens Police Explorers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Okay, that, uh, I have no more cards in front of me, so I am going to move on to city manager report. Thank you, Mayor, Council, Council members. Just a few items to bring to your attention. Once again, our purchasing department has received an award. It's the Universal Public Procurement Certification Council. It's awarded the city with the 2017 Agency Certi Certification Award. Uh, this is created formally to recognize the agency's commitment to the value of certification in the public sector. And I quote, 
from the chair of the governing board, your organization is a fine example of what is becoming a strong indicator of success within state and local governments. The accomplishments speak volumes of your agency's commitment and dedication to the profession and skills and expertise that you bring to the public procurement industry. I would like for all of you to uh, recognize our uh, public purchasing procurement department. Would they please stand up and be recognized? Our department of one. Thank you, Kumra. Thank you, Kumra. Next is our police department received a Florida Law Enforcement Liaison Traffic Safety Challenge Award from the Department of Transportation and National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. This award recognizes the best overall traffic safety programs in Florida. Palm Beach Gardens Police Department placed second in Category 4, which is uh, agencies with 101 to 200 officers. Uh, they look at uh, challenge, uh, challenges on such items as enfor enforcement of traffic safety laws, public education about distracted and impaired driving, motorcycle safety, vehicle, vehicle occupant protection and child passenger safety, pedestrian and bicycle safety, speed and aggressive driving. So please join me with congratulating our police department for receiving this traffic safety award. <laughs> Next, I'd like to uh, remind everyone that on July 18th from 5.30 to 7 o'clock here at City Hall, we have, uh, we're hosting the consumer outreach event from the State of Florida Insurance Commissioner Consumer Advocate Sharon James. We had that here last year, it was well attended, and a lot of people got some very good information and help, including some of our very own uh, employees that uh, Sharon and her office was able to help uh, traverse through uh, a, a particularly difficult process, but to get some assistance. She will be here to hear all the concerns and issues regarding state insurance programs. So. Uh, be here. It's free to the public from 5.30 to 7 on July 18th. We'll have some refreshments. There are flyers on the table over there that you can take home. So if you're having problems with your insurance, uh, come here and meet uh, Mrs. James, Ms. James, and she will see what she can do to help you. So this is our state uh, office on this issue. Uh, at the same time, I would like to let you know uh, that uh, the North Lake Boulevard Task Force had a meeting on July 10th. It was attended by myself, uh, Council Member Woods, and some staff. The program consisted of a report from FDOT representatives uh, on the interchange of I-95 and North Lake primarily, but then they also covered PGA and I-95 and Central at I-95. Uh, the report was, uh, presentation was received well by the North Lake Task Force, which is representatives of the county, Palm Beach Gardens, North Palm, and Lake Park. Uh, and at that meeting, I'm happy to announce that uh, they appointed a chairman for the task force this year, and it's your very young Council Member Woods. <laughs> also today, we spent a couple of hours with uh, Council Member Lane and the representatives of the Gardens of Woodbury HOA in discussing uh, concerns, issues, uh, and mitigation strategies for the uh, extension of the Shady Lakes Drive. Uh, we uh, had a good meeting. I think we've addressed all of the issues and concerns, and we will be putting that in writing in the near future and sharing that with the rest of the council so that you'll see that our plans are intact and, and we will continue with the beautification and the construction of that road. Also, we did have a budget oversight meeting on June 22, uh, of which uh, on the 23rd we sent the uh, draft minutes and the audio file uh, link uh, to all the council members. Once the uh, minutes have been approved and adopted by that board, we'll put them on the public website for our citizens to see. And we'll do the same for all of the other boards that we're uh, currently meeting with. 
and I believe that's the end of my report. All right, we have a large consent agenda. Does anyone have anything they want to pull from the agenda? Yes, um, I'm going to go ahead, Matt. Mark, go ahead. I just wanted a, a brief presentation, Natalie, on Resolution 45, as we discussed uh, yesterday at our meeting. I'd like to pull a uh, purchase award RFQ 2017-013RC about the new tennis center, as we discussed yesterday. And I would actually like to pull Proclamation um, R and Proclamation S. I see Cynthia Healthco and Karen Harvey in the audience, and I'd like to give you your proclamations in person. So with that, uh, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda with the items we have removed? So moved. Second? Second. Favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me do the proclamations first and then we'll do the presentations. Uh, Penny, can you come up also? There, um, for those of you in the audience that don't know, these ladies were successful winners of the SCORE Small Business uh, Winners, and their businesses are right here in Palm Beach Gardens, and I appreciate everything that you've done, the investment of time and effort you've done in our city, and Penny, thank you for putting this whole effort together as your, your position with SCORE, and thank you for actually having me on your radio program to learn more about you. Thank you. Do you have the proclamation? Um, Karen Harvey does senior, what, Karen, why don't you take a second and describe what you do, and Cynthia, why don't you do the same? Shame on me for not doing that myself. But it's better here coming from you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to do so. I have a business called Senior Transitions. Would Solutions. you give us your name and address for the record? Karen Harvey, 5177 Spice Drive, Palm Beach Gardens, 33418. Thank you. My company is called Senior Transition Solutions, Inc., and we help seniors with all the overwhelming details associated with moving, liquidation, and organizing. So we help seniors who are going through this overwhelming transition, moving from a home of 20, 30, 50 plus years of accumulated treasures and memories and moving from their home into a new home sweet home. So we take care of all the details associated with moving by coordinating all the, the different elements from uh, getting prepared, sorting, packing, unpacking, and finally setting up their new home, unpacking all, the de all, the, all their stuff, uh, making the beds, organizing the closets, uh, hanging the pictures, you name it, we do it. In the end, um, it's all finished, home sweet home for them. Thank you so much. And Cynthia. Hello, Cynthia Heathcoe, 13793 53rd Court. 
My business is Contemporary Living, where we make your room happen. And tell us where you are. I am located downtown at the gardens. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, my business is one born out of a passion to create uh, a home in a space for my clients that they feel safe, comfortable, and that fits their unique style. One of the great things about my store is that um, at all points, a client is engaged with either an owner on the front end, which is myself, or with my husband on the back end, taking care of things and receiving scheduling and service. We are a true mom and pop shop living the American dream. As a Palm Beach County resident for many years, 18 years ago, I was um, graduated from a local homeless shelter and have been able to rebuild my life in really see the full potential that living in Palm Beach County has to provide for myself. Um, our business is one that is a little bit more unique. You don't just walk in, pick it up, and walk out. We really sit down with you one-on-one. -on -one. We create a design that really works for your individual style. Whether you love neutrals or you love bold, bright colors, we can really make all that happen. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you all for indulging me, but I, I thought it was important. Thank you. Now on to the items that we were, we pulled from the agenda, the consent agenda. Um, excuse me, Mayor. Since yes. the resolution was pulled, I have to read the title. Oh, thank you. Uh, resolution 45, 2017, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, approving an interlocal agreement with Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council for the South Florida Transit Oriented Development Grant the City received for its station area planning, authorizing the Mayor to execute the agreement, providing an effective date and further purposes. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Natalie Crowley, I'm the Director of Planning and Zoning, and I'm very pleased to provide a brief overview of what this resolution is. Joining us this evening is Kim Delaney, she's with Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council, she's staff there, and Kim, I'm gonna ask you to, to come on up here and, and maybe say a couple words as well as to what this grant is all about. Um, back a few months ago, city staff submitted a grant uh, to the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council for station planning. So as many of you are aware, uh, what has happened with Tri-Rail is that it had, based on All Aboard Florida and its advancement and its anticipated construction north, this has provided uh, much of the infrastructure that will be necessary to carry forward Tri-Rail. PGA Boulevard has long been on the books as a future station based on the employment and based on the land use patterns. And many years ago, being proactive, staff worked with Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council staff and had a series of, uh, ha had a, a large charrette and had a series of uh, public involvement that involved um, really the planning for tri-rail tri when it came. Much has happened since that time. There has been many developments uh, both uh, in and around the vicinity with FPNL's future campus and the campus on 5B and uh, the Gosman site, just to name a few. Uh, so this grant was submitted to the Regional Planning Council in order to be proactive to be able to appropriately plan for the tri-rail station and actually design out a, a future tri-rail station and to take a close look at the city's zoning code and the land use codes to ensure that they are uh, appropriately fit for mobility and, and tri-rail. Uh, uh, the city was fortunate enough to win a grant amount of 120,000 and with a match of 30,000, the award amount is for 150,000, which will be used for design services. Uh, I also want to mention that this is really kicking off the scope of the study, which will involve uh, definitely the public. There is anticipated involvement with the public. A public workshop will occur, uh, as well as a, an ultimate final presentation to the City Council of, of what the outcome is. So I don't know if I've missed anything, but Kim, if you'd like to mention anything. Absolutely. Uh, hi, Kim Delaney for the record from Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council. So thanks for the opportunity to address the, the Council. Um, congratulations um, on having the highest ranked uh, application in Palm Beach County um, and the second highest ranked overall. Uh, the Regional Planning Council worked with uh, our partner council, the South Florida Regional Planning Council, as well as the SFRTA, the South Florida Regional Transportation Authority, which operates Tri-Rail, to bring these grant dollars down uh, from uh, the Federal Transit Administration. So we were successful in bringing down $860,000 in planning dollars to look specifically at future Tri-Rail stations. Um, there were seven 
um, locations that were uh, funded through the uh, grant application process. Again, the gardens, um, the gardens application was the highest ranked in Palm Beach County and the second highest ranked overall, which was really tremendous. Um, what we know in looking at the preliminary numbers is that the ridership that's anticipated for the Palm Beach Garden Station is really the reason why it's justifiable to extend tri-rail north. So it's the most important station from a ridership standpoint um, in the northern section. Um, and so um, for that reason and for the changing land use conditions that Natalie mentioned, um, the station, uh, at the, the uh, planning application the city submitted really ranked very highly. We have to get the station right uh, for the system to be successful and we know that. So from a regional standpoint, it's a, it's a critically important station. Um, one of the things that we're able to do with the grant dollars, um, as Natalie alluded to, is not only carry out a public workshop process to help, um, uh, to help the community um, and you as a council envision what's appropriate from a station standpoint, a design standpoint, but also look at kind of the nuts and bolts of how to make it happen. So one piece of the process is kind of figuring out what you want, what's the chocolate cake look like, and then how do you make that cake happen? That's the comprehensive plan policies, the land development regulations, and understanding the economics of what makes that work. Um, so with these funds, we're able to bring all those resources to bear to be able to come back with a very holistic um, approach for the city to consider. Um, and so happy to answer more questions if you have them. I'll be the project manager for the city, um, and we're working with your staff um, in looking at um, time frames uh, to, uh, um, to carry out the due diligence, bringing in the economists, and then um, working through the public workshop process and then coming back to the council later this year in the beginning of next. Okay. May I have a motion? Sure. So moved. Second? I'll second. Thank, thank you, Nana. Discussion? Everybody's questions answered? Yes. Thank you. Um, the next, re the next item? I'm sorry? Question. Who has a question? You call the question. I did. All in favor? I did. All in favor? Sorry. That's okay. I'll do it again. <laughs> thank you. Patty, would you read the title? Oh, no, ma'am. This is just a purchase award. I don't need to read anything. Thank you. Good evening, City Council. Kumura, Purchasing and Contracts Director, for the record. And accompanying me is Lauren Schubert, a Recreations Director. I'm going to give you a short PowerPoint presentation on the new Tennis Center Clubhouse project. The existing Tennis Center has a very small clubhouse and the city has included in its capital improvements plans, um, plans to construct a new clubhouse for the tennis center. Um, it would include a cafe and a, a kitchen, a grill, a pro shop, etc. And to achieve this, this, pro this, this project, the city advertised uh, an RFQ, a request for qualification, select an architect to do the A&E services for the project. This is what the existing, club, the existing clubhouse and tennis center looks like. It's a close-up of the little clubhouse. Okay. It's like 2,100 square feet. After reviewing and scoring the proposal, the selection committee selected Olson Lavoy Collaborative as the firm considered best suited to provide the architectural services. Um, the firm proposed an initial sum of $321,000, and city staff negotiated with the vendor and lower the price to $220,000. Remember, this is just for the design of the building. These are the architects who responded. There are 10 architects who responded. Um, Olson of is ranked one, then ranked at number two was Sinolovsky Romnik Say, and number three was RG Architects. The selection committee chose to shortlist the top three ranked and brought them in for interviews and for discussions, and after that, the selection committee then chose to maintain the rankings. And they could have consensus, con do a consensus vote and change the rankings, but they kept the rankings. The reason why Olson Lavoie Collaborative was selected is because they had the most experience in developing and constructing um, tennis centers and sports facilities. Staff recommends approval, and I have a very short video fly through I'd like to show you and the residents so you can have an idea of what we're looking to construct. The building will be on the existing footprint and it will go up an additional story.
Well, considering the praise that we've gotten for our tennis facility, it's about time we have a clubhouse that fits that praise. That is it correct. is very small right now. That's correct. Next time I ask him to put some music to it so it just <laughs> looks. I'm just happy you didn't have shots of me hitting it into the net on court 11. Oh, we deleted that out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you have any questions? I have no questions. I do. Um, I, I, here's where I'm going to start. Um, I think the tennis facility is fantastic. I think Bill McDermott does an exceptional job. Great guy, wonderful job. The instruction there is, is wonderful. We is probably the best tennis instructor I've ever met. Um, our rec program is, is, is exceptional. Laura does an incredible job. My son had some of the best years of his life at the uh, PGA summer camp, and, uh, and he grew up in the parks. We, we grew up in the parks, which are wonderful facilities. My question here is we're spending a lot of money. We're spending about $3 million. I'm known as being somewhat cheap. It's hard for me to spend money. Um, I just want to get a sense of what the general vision is because the $3 million that we had to earn in, in paying taxes, um, what's the overall vision? What, in terms of the cafe and the kitchens and the grill area, what's the business model? What are we trying to accomplish here? Um, I, I know that there are good answers to those questions and, and I just would like you to present to the community, you know, where the, our $3 million is, do we need a, a building? Do we need a $3 million building? And where are we spending our money? Okay. Okay. First, uh, Laura Schupert, Recreation Director. For the record, um, first and foremost, the uh, funding for this project is uh, coming from the Ordinance 10, 2017. So this was part of your penny sales tax, one of those projects. And the vision is twofold. Um, primarily, as Kumra uh, suggested, this is a 21 square foot facility right now. We have 18 tennis courts. So we're servicing up to 500 members. That's just members on a daily, on a, almost a daily basis. We're servicing over 90 hours a week at that tennis center, and we're really we're we're at our, our wits' end at the at the at the space. Um, monthly, we have tournaments with 200 children with their parents and their grandparents who come. Um, so financially, we have done the homework. We've done the financials, and we will operate in the black. It's more than financial, though, when you look at a return on investment. We have a social obligation here. This is going to be an incredible sports campus. Not only is it going to service our tennis patrons, but it's going to service the Russo Park. It's going to service the brand new district park. So this is going to be the hub of the social of that whole area. So the vision is, is, is gin ginormous, but it's very well needed, and it's going to be spectacular. Thank you, Laura. And Laura, thank you. Right. Any other questions? Anyone else? I just think that you know we are striving to be a world-class city. We are a world-class city, and, and all of our facilities need to show that. And this is just another place where we have to show that we are exceptional in, in every way. And, and I'm excited to see it come through. And I don't play tennis, but uh, I wish I did. Maybe I will one day. Thanks. Rochelle? As someone who has played tennis over there and been part of women's leagues, I know how difficult it is over there when it comes time for the leagues to have their, their lunches afterward and compared to the other facilities that they go to. Um, we have a world-class golf facility in the city and I think a tennis facility that matches what we're doing out at Sand Hill Crane can only enhance it. It's for the residents of the city. So many of our residents live in gated communities. They have their clubhouses. This is for those residents that do not. Um, of course, everyone can use it, but it does give that club feel to, to the rest of the community, and I think the plan is beautiful. I actually even know some members at PGA National that are members at the Tennis Center. So we're matching what we're doing at the golf clubhouse here. We're trying to give our residents a place to, once they've played, they can stay and enjoy each other's company and converse and eat and um, ha maybe have more tournaments. And 
it's a great way to make an investment in our city. So I thank you all for your work on this. Thank and you. I thank you for your questions. And it's okay to be cheap, Matt, but. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Responsible. And Max, what do we do now? We need a motion and a vote to approve it, ma'am. May I have a motion? I'll make the motion. To May I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Next item on the agenda. Tonight we are holding quasi-judicial hearings on the following case. Resolution 46, 2017, Public Safety Communications Monopol. This means that the City Council is required by law to base its decision on the evidence contained in the record of this proceeding, which consists of the testimony at the hearing, the materials which are in the official city file on this application, and any documents presented during this hearing. The Council is also required by law to allow cross-examination of any witness, witnesses who testify tonight. Cross-examination may occur after the staff, the applicant, and other participants have made their presentations and will be permitted in the, excuse me, and will be permitted in the order of the witness's appearance. It is necessary that anyone who testifies at the hearing remain until the conclusion of the hearing in order to be able to respond to any questions. If you plan to testify this evening or wish to offer written comments, please fill out a card and give it to the city clerk. The city clerk will now swear in all persons who intend to offer testimony in this evening on any of these cases. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Will you read the title? Yes, ma'am. Resolution 46, 2017, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, approving a major conditional use to allow a public safety communications monopole in the Lake Catherine Sportsplex, located on the east side of MacArthur Boulevard and north of North Lake Boulevard, is more particularly described herein, providing conditions of approval, providing waivers, providing an effective date for other purposes. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Dawn Sonneborn with the Planning and Zoning Department, and I have been sworn in. Um, this is a presentation on Resolution 46, 2017. The Planning Department and the Police Department have worked collaborati collaboratively on this uh, petition, and Officer Kevin O'Connor is here with me this evening to present. This is a request for a major conditional use for a monopole uh, for a safety communications uh, tower um, in the, Catherine, the Lake Catherine Sportsplex complex. Uh, there is a request for four waivers included with this. The location will be in the northeast corner of the Lake Catherine Sportsplex. Um, there's existing ball fields there. There's no, gonna be no impacts to those ball fields with the location that's been selected. Uh, the boundary of the monopole is approximately 607 feet from the nearest residential lot, which is well over the 500 feet required by code. The blue area is the actual site boundary for the monopole site. It's approximately 30 by 50 feet. It will be fenced and screened. There'll be a small mechanical equipment structure that you see there. There's a little image of it in the bottom of the screen. Um, and uh, there'll be existing um, mature uh, uh, landscaping to the north boundary of the park as well. There's two other um, towers that are, uh, one is 0.43 miles um, from the old Dixie Highway Tower, another is 0.47 miles from one located on North Lake Boulevard just uh, west of Burma Road. Uh, that is one of the waivers that um, is in the package this evening. And the police department provided photo, a photo simulation so you can see what the uh, monopole would look like. This is um, from the going into the entrance of the uh, park, looking eastward. This is actually coming out of the Lake Catherine residential community, looking eastward. And this is driving south along MacArthur Boulevard, looking directly east. And you can see the monopole there in the background. And I'll turn it over to Officer O'Connor right now. He can tell you a little bit more about the monopole itself. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council, Mr. Ferris. Um, the desire for this project has a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is the initial site that we're on right now um, is a lease site. The lease is up in 2018. 
The lease amount is approaching almost $40,000 a year, and it has 3.5% escalators on it. So we're looking to move away from that site and construct the site. Uh, this site would have a return on investment of approximately five years at this point. The other side of this is, is at that site, we've suffered numerous thefts off the site, one of them which caused the site to get hit by lightning, and because the lightning protection was not in play because the wiring was missing from it, it actually downed the site for about five hours. So that site is on Richard Road and Old Dixie right now. It's just a little bit outside our jurisdictional boundaries. So the desire would be to bring this inside the jurisdiction where it could be better protected and have more surface look where than where it is right now. Um, those are the two big factors. This site was chosen because of its proximity to where the existing site is. So it would cover the same adequate coverage from an RF perspective that it does today. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, what it does is it provides two-way communications to the police officers for our radio systems, and we have multiple jurisdictions that actually utilize us. The Palm Beach County School Board is a customer on the system, as well as the uh, city of North Palm Beach. And because we dispatch for them, the proximity of that tower needs to be somewhat in the location where it is right now. So we're kind of limited on how far we can move that tower to provide the same level of service that we are today. Any other questions? Well, as a potential future um, revenue generator, I suppose there might be opportunities to lease some portion of this pool to other I would have to entities. I would have to defer perhaps. that back to PNZ on that one, but I would say yes, there is a definite potential. Thank you. Anyone yeah. else? Agreed. I think the biggest challenge that we're having with the existing site is that it's in an area where it never gets any eyes on it from a law enforcement perspective. And I think that's the biggest challenge over there. It's, in a, it's right next to Brinker Concrete over there, or, and that, that site just doesn't get any look at. We've had issues with homeless over there breaking into it, and it's outside our jurisdiction, so we have no way to do anything about it. We've called the sheriff's office, made some reports on it, but you know, it's just in that area where it just doesn't get enough eyeball on it from law enforcement. I'm confident in our police department, yes, sir. <laughs> Anyone else? And before I run, I would just like to say thank you to Natalie and her staff, specifically Dawn, for assisting me with this project, because without their help, I wouldn't have gotten it this far today. So thank you. I have a couple more slides. Uh, the package that you have this evening does have a request for four waivers. Uh, minimum size, the tower is set back from tower uh, boundary lines, separation and height. Uh, they all have justification for the waivers. Uh, this is a critical public safety infrastructure and this will greatly improve the communication so staff is in full support. Uh, we also looked at the conditional use criteria and the petition does meet the criteria with the requested waivers. Uh, the uh, petition has been uh, noticed properly with the ad signs and the mailers. The Planning and Zoning Board uh, on June 13th reviewed and uh, recommended approval by a vote of six to zero for the petition and staff recommends approval of Resolution 46-2017 as presented. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have no cards on this. Is there anyone wishing to speak? If not, before I actually before I close the hearing were there any ex partes on this I didn't ask earlier no. anyone okay so I will close the hearing may I get a motion and a second I move that we adopt this resolution second thank you all those in favor aye thank you very much now the purchase award Do we need to discuss the purchase award? No, ma'am. That part of it? No. The action is on your sheet that okay. needs to be taken. All righty. We have a motion to accept the purchase the, the purchase award, which goes is a companion item to resolution forty six. So moved. May I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you.
Now we are moving on to Resolution 41, 2017. May the clerk read the title. Resolution 41, 2017, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, adopting a proposed maximum millage rate for the City of Palm Beach Gardens for fiscal year 2017, 2018, setting the date, time, and place of the first budget hearing, providing an effective date and for other purposes. Okay. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council. For the record, Alan Owens, Finance Administrator. Resolution 41, 2017 is the uh, first required official action regarding the adoption of the 2017 and 2018 budget. Uh, the purpose uh, for this resolution is really twofold. Per state statutes, we are required to establish maximum millage rates and also to establish the date and time for the first public hearing. What we do with this information is we transfer it to the uh, property appraiser's office and they use it when they prepare the notice of proposed taxes that are mailed out in August. So as far as the specifics for next year's budget, staff is uh, recommending that we set the operating millage rate the same as it is this year, which is 5.55 mils, and establish the debt service millage at 0.1178, which is down slightly from the current year's rate. Uh, for a total millage rate of 5.6678, uh, which is down from the current year total of 5.6781. That proposed operating rate of 5.55 represents a 5.37% increase over the rollback rate of 5.2671. Uh, and as you know, during the public hearings, these rates uh, cannot go higher. They could be lowered. And as I said earlier, we also must notify the property appraiser of the date and time for the first public hearing. Uh, those meetings cannot conflict with school board and Palm Beach County uh, board or uh, budget hearings and the dates slated for those meetings are September 5th, 6th, and the 18th. Uh, therefore, staff is recommending that our first public hearing be held on September 7th, 2017, which is a Thursday. And staff recommends approval of resolution 41, 2017, setting a maximum operating millage of 5.55 and debt millage of 0.1178 and setting a date for the first public hearing on September 7th, 2017 at 7 p.m. in the council chambers. I'd be happy to answer any questions. May I have a motion and a second? I'll make a motion. Second. Okay, and I'd like to bring it for, back for discussion. Um, who has questions? Anyone? Comments? I'm gonna postpone my comments until after the city attorney's report. Um, I would actually like to comment on a couple of things. I'm um, reading yesterday's Palm Beach Post and listening to the county, county tentatively okay, their same tax rate and their figures and how they um, are concerned with the uh, $25,000 homestead exemption. I like the fact that we're able to keep our rates and we've been able to use uh, the same rate to help us with our five-year plan. Mm -hmm. um, I knew I was... When you gave the, the presentation last month about the $25,000 homestead exemption and the impact it was gonna have on the city, it made it even more important for us to try to keep our millage rate the same. So I appreciate your, all your efforts on this. Okay. Um, if you wanna hold your discussion till after the attorney's report, then we can't make a motion on it now. Sure you can. Yeah, we yep. can make a motion. Yeah, you've got a motion in a second. So the comments can be later. Okay, but now I'm taking a vote. So, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. I know, I'm not using the gavel, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're moving on to resolution 49-2017. May the clerk please read the title. Resolution 49, 2017, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, creating the 2017 Charter Review Committee, providing a purpose, powers, duties, membership, and meetings, providing an effective date for other purposes. Thank you. Do we have a presentation? 
Um, well, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, but Resolution 49-2017 is creating the Charter Review Committee, which, as I just read in the title, provides for the uh, powers, purpose, duties, memberships, and meetings. And as stated in the staff report, in order for the proposed charter amendments to be on the March 13th uniform municipal election, the following timeline has been prepared. Tonight, you have Resolution 49 before you, uh, establishing the committee. On August 3rd, you will uh, have a resolution before you appointing members to the Charter Review Committee. And council has been asked to please submit their names to me uh, no later than July 24th for inclusion on the August 3rd. Um, the committee can begin meeting the week of August 7th, which allows seven weeks for the committee to develop the proposed changes and prepare their final report. Um, I have tentatively scheduled the council chambers because uh, the Mondays and Wednesdays from August 3rd through September were available, so I've tentatively reserved those. It will be, be up to the committee, of course, to set those meetings. Uh, the Charter Review Committee will present their final report to council on October 12th, which at that time uh, the committee will sunset. The uh, first reading of the referendum ordinance will be on the November 2nd uh, City Council meeting. Uh, second reading and adoption will be on December 7th, and the ballot language is due to the Supervisor of Elections on February 2nd, 2018 at noon. Thank you. Um, may I have a motion and a second? I'll make a motion to accept Resolution 49, 2017. Second. Thank you. Now we're moving on to Resolution 49, 2017. May the clerk please read the title. Resolution 49-2017, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, creating the 2017 Charter Review Committee, providing a purpose, powers, duties, membership, and meetings, providing an effective date for other purposes. Thank you. Do we have a presentation? Uh, well, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, but Resolution 49-2017 is creating the Charter Review Committee, which, as I just read in the title, provides for the uh, powers, purpose, duties, memberships, and meetings. And as stated in the staff report, in order for the proposed charter amendments to be on the March 13th uniform municipal election, the following timeline has been prepared. Tonight, you have Resolution 49 before you, uh, establishing the committee. On August 3rd, you will uh, have a resolution before you appointing members to the Charter Review Committee. And council has been asked to please submit their names to me uh, no later than July 24th for inclusion on the August 3rd. Um, the committee can begin meeting the week of August 7th, which allows seven weeks for the committee to develop the proposed changes and prepare their final report. Um, I have tentatively scheduled the council chambers because uh, the Mondays and Wednesdays from August 3rd through September were available, so I've tentatively reserved those. It will be, be up to the committee, of course, to set those meetings. Uh, the Charter Review Committee will present their final report to council on October 12th, which at that time uh, the committee will sunset. The uh, first reading of the referendum ordinance will be on the November 2nd uh, City Council meeting. Uh, second reading and adoption will be on December 7th, and the ballot language is due to the Supervisor of Elections on February 2nd, 2018, at noon. Thank you. Um, may I have a motion and a second? I'll make a motion to accept Resolution 49-2017. Thank you. I actually have one card. When is the appropriate time to bring up Ms. Scheibel? Iris, state your name and your address for the record, please. See, that wasn't on my cheat sheet, so I had to put yeah, that I in I wondered there. why you were ready to vote already. <laughs> uh, good evening, Council. Iris Scheibel, 1029 Siena Oak, Circle West. Last month, staff recommended the uniform municipal elections in March 2018 as the target for any charter modifications that you select to be on the ballot. They rejected the August primary election due to too many other items and voter fatigue. November was rejected by staff outright, saying Supervisor of Elections Booker would not permit the question on the ballot. What staff did not say is that the last two times charter-related items were on the ballot, they occurred in November. 
The city pays the supervisor of elections to man manage elections for the city. The city has the ability to negotiate November, especially when we're more than a year from the November 2018 election. And there was no voter fatigue in 2012 and 2014 when vo vo excuse me, voters made their voices heard on the city's ballot items. Should there be significant charter changes proposed with respect to something, for example, like elections, then such changes to our charter should be on a November ballot. With no council openings to be voted upon, even with publicity, the city would be lucky to get 2,000 voters to vote in the March election. Contrast that with the 20,000 or so that voted in November 2014 on term limits, or the 22,000 and 23,000 that voted in 2012 on the two charter items, or the 19,000 in 2010 on the county question on the city's participation in the ethics and IG ordinances. The charter is the city's constitution, and charter changes deserve the broadest turnout of the city's residents. Leave the charter committee's work product timeline as it is, but please move the ballot date to November 2018. Thank you. Thank you. I have a comment on. Well, I, we I, had I, a motion and a second, so we'll bring it back for discussion. Oh, okay. Is that safe? Yeah, no, we had the motion in the second, so now we can do the discussion. I, I actually did speak with Supervisor Elections Booker in regards to timing and possible dates to put this election on. I understand the limitations of a March 18 election. I very much want to make sure that this election of, of the Charter Review, assuming it gets to an actual vote, will happen before the March 2019 election for, for, uh, for council, for the two council seats that will be up for election. Um, she was very adamant that the November election was not going to be available. She wants to set a protocol, and I understand that that has happened in the past, obviously, just not too, too long ago. There were some uh, reasons for that. She would not even entertain the idea of, of a November election. She wants all municipal elections to be held in March. So yes, we are going to have to have a we are going to have a small voter turnout. Uh, we have to do our best, and you and all the residents that are in this room and everybody else we can talk to are going to have to do their best to make sure we have as much participation as possible. Uh, it's the best option we have, and it's the option that I'm going to have to accept because I don't think August is a good time, and um, and if November is not an option specifically from her voice to me, then I'm going to have to accept what she said. Thank you. Anyone else have comments? I will call the question. May I have uh, everyone in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Thank you very much. Now, items for, no. Oh. <laughs> items. items for council action and discussion. City manager evaluation. Any comments? Everyone, anyone? Well, I'll make a comment. Uh, since, since the election and since we've all been new, I've had uh, very good communications with our city manager and I've appreciated the openness and the availability. So at this stage of the game, I'm happy that, um, that I feel comfortable with, with uh, my communications with them and, and um, we'll just continue that relationship as we go forward to make sure we're doing the best for our citizens and, and the city as a whole. Rochelle? At this point, I would like to thank Ron, too, for his open door, his willingness to answer any questions that we have, whether we've agreed on issues behind closed doors or not. We've always been able to, to discuss things, and I just want to thank him for that, and we held our review, and look forward to going forward. Matthew? I can tell you that the people that I respect tell me that this is one of the best managed cities that they've had the opportunity to, uh, to work in. These are some of the smartest, most successful, capable people that I know. And they can't say enough about the city manager and what an excellent job he's doing. Uh, I look forward to continuing to be a, a partner with uh, our city manager. As we continue to keep this city the way it is, the finest city um, in, in Florida and possibly one of the finest cities in the country. Thank you. Carl? Um, 
considering how I came in to office with a little bit of a different angle, um, nobody knew what they were getting when they got me in. I didn't know what to expect when I got here either. But we, um, we had a handshake and it was, you know, we decided to trust each other right from the beginning. And I noticed, um, you know, I had a lot of projects that I wanted to do for the citizens in the Platts. And I voiced, voiced my opinion on those. And right away we started building a trust and everything happened. If I asked for something, if I inquired, if I needed some information, I got it all immediately, not just in a handwritten note or a phone call. It was almost a personal PowerPoint presentation on some of the smallest things. He helped me get a park built. Um, the people in the plat just told me the other day they're still, you know, they still see the, uh, that area moving forward in a positive direction. And just using that as an example, um, my experience with this city manager has been um, professional. And what I hear from the citizens on some of the people that like the city or don't like the city, everybody says, no matter what we feel, that city is run well. And um, we all know this is a great city. And it wouldn't be like this if it wasn't on behalf of the city manager in large part. So um, in his evaluation, just like the first day when I met him, I shook his hand and I said, thank you, let's keep doing it. Thank you, Carl. I'd like to echo everyone's sentiment and I'd ab absolutely like to add my own. Um, being mayor after one year on council is <laughs> um, an interesting proposition and Ron and staff, you have afforded all of us the opportunity to learn. Um, I trust your instincts. I trust your experience. I thank you very much for that. Um, I know that I said when I walked into my agenda review, <coughs> I hear it every day from all over the county how wonderful our city is. And I guess I was lucky enough to actually not have to campaign. Um, and, and one of the questions was, what, you know, what is your platform? And I said, do you know our city? This is the city of Palm Beach Gardens. We're a fabulous city. We're well run. We're well funded. We have two men, Alan and, and Ron, who live in the city, who watch every penny, um, doing a, a phenomenal job to keep us steady, keep us afloat, keep us going straight and narrow with the uh, foresight, <laughs> the foresight of dealing with 50,000 people that are, in 1959 when we were chartered, the first, if you go back and read our minutes from 1959, we were chartered with the thought that we were going to have 50,000 people on about 3,500 acres of land in eight years because of migration to Florida. Uh, we've just accomplished that 60 years later. So I thank you for being the stewards of that. And with that, I am, I've had enough to say. Is there any other discussion that anyone would like to take up? Um, I just want to make sure that I have a chance to make a couple of comments uh, in regards to the, the millage rate and the budget. But I, I, you know, we, we were presented some information yesterday from the city attorney, and I think it's important that we hear that before, uh, before anything else comes up. Is, is that okay if we do the city, attorney report. city attorney report first and then continue the items of resident discussion afterwards? Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Max, please give us your report. Yes, this is one of those rare occasions where I actually have a city attorney report. As some of you may be, well, all, of, all five of you are aware, but for the public, you know, we, we were involved in a lawsuit. We were sued by Sears, Roebuck and Company, along with uh, Palm Beach Gardens Mall, pursuant to our adoption of Resolution 202012 back in the uh, year 20, 2012. And we won at trial. Um, the uh, opinion, the, the, re the trial court's um, ruling was appealed by Sears. Uh, we went to the Fourth District Court of Appeal. We, it was fully briefed. We had oral argument back in April, and the, uh, the Fourth, Dist Fourth District Court of Appeal's opinion was uh, issued. Their, their opinion was issued yesterday at 9 10 in the morning, and unfortunately, they reversed um, the trial court's ruling. They ruled in favor of Sears. And they declared resolution 2020-12 unconstitutional and pursuant to the alleged, uh, to the allegations contained in their complaint, uh, the Fourth District Court of Appeal um, awarded attorney's fees under section, under 42 USC 1983 and 1988. Um, our options uh, at this point are to 
uh, file a motion for clarification, a motion for a hearing on bonk, um, or to accept the, uh, the opinion of the Fourth District Court of Appeal. Um, at this particular point in time, and I've, I've gone back through it and researched it and looked at the, uh, the Florida Rules of Appellate Procedure, and I, I don't really see a way forward to uh, attempt to invoke the uh, discretionary jurisdiction of the Florida Supreme Court, so that's really not an option for us. Um, motions for rehearing on bonk are typically frowned upon by the courts and are rarely granted, so I don't think that there's a very, if, even if I filed the motion, I don't think it's very likely that the Fourth District Court of Appeal would grant it. Um, a motion for clarification of the order is even less likely to be looked upon favorably by the Fourth District Court of Appeal. So I guess in a nutshell, what I'm saying is that my, my, my recommendation to the council is, to, um, is that we accept the, uh, the ruling of the Fourth District Court of Appeal and uh, we'll move forward to um, see what we can do to um, ascertain the uh, extent of the uh, attorney's fees award that, that Sears will get and um, deal with that as it comes. They will be remanding that to the trial court and um, then we would end up having a hearing in front of, uh, go back to Judge Garrison or Judge Haffel, most likely back to Judge Garrison and we would have an evidentiary hearing and expert testimony on, uh, on attorney's fees um, to, uh, for them to justify what their uh, fee claim would be. Questions? Comments? Yeah, I've discussed this in, in detail with the city attorney. Can you put your microphone yeah, on, please? I've discussed this matter in detail with the city attorney, and, uh, and I concur with the city attorney's uh, recommendation based upon my review of the opinion and my knowledge of the case. Mark. Yeah. Um, so it... Um, well, yeah. before we do that, uh, unrelated to... I mean, the first thing, I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> and I'm glad, Matthew... You made that comment because I was going to look at you and see what kind of response and reaction you're going to have. And, and I'm, I'm kind of grateful that we're not f pursuing an additional appeal because they don't tend to, in my limited experience of appeals, they don't usually turn back. Uh, and that would just add more time and more dollars to this. So there's, there's two questions I have. Th the first one is, you know, first, the sad part is is the dollars that we're looking at to to compensate Sears for the for the legal fees and and I know you've kind of made a comment about that and and then a second I'd ask you to tell us what you think the rough estimate was going to be and where the dollars are going to come from and then two how does this impact the future of of, of I guess this resolution as a whole is is no longer uh, valid so um, what impact does that have and any other properties in the city other than at the mall. I think it, b before b before Max answers that question, I think he really should look and see what their uh, application is going to say before he makes an opinion in public, uh, a recommendation on that. I think he needs to see it first before he comments on it. It would be way That's premature. Fine. That's fine. Correct. Yeah. And as, as far as um, my little two cents, I'd, I'd like to let this thing play itself out and make choices as we go and take baby steps. But for the obvious, my personal feeling and what I think would be best for the citizens is because Resolution 20, 2012 has been deemed unconstitutional, I would request the council to us collectively to uh, direct the city attorney to repeal the resolution and remove its contents from the books completely. That would be my feel for just starters. I concur. Okay, so we need a motion and a second for what, 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 I, what I need is a, is a, is a uh, I will need a motion and a vote to, to direct me to um, not file an appeal um, or, or a motion for rehearing on Bonk, if you will, and basically a motion to accept the ruling and then to um, address the attorney's fees provision um, with, uh, through whatever, whatever means ends up being um, available to us uh, that should be remanded to the court. But that's basically what I need is just a motion to accept the ruling. So moved. Second. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. And we will, Carl's, Carl's. Um, Your direction by direction. consensus to draft a, a yes. resolution repealing 2020-12. I, we can certainly do that and put it on for the, uh, for the next meeting. Um, and uh, again, I can't really speculate on to what, what the fees would be at this time. As, as uh, uh, Council Member Lane points out, it would be, um, it might be a, it, it's not. It's not really to our advantage to to opine on that at this particular point in time. 
but um, rest assured, I will be doing my very best to minimize our exposure as much as humanly possible. Um, but we will we'll proceed and see and see where it goes. Um, any any fee amount that that we would pay would um, most likely come out of reserves. Thank you. Okay, so we have concluded the city attorney's report. Do we want to go back to items for council action and discussion? Do we have anything else anyone would like to to question or comment? Nothing. I'd like to make a quick comment. Okay. And it's in regards to uh, it. Kind of ties in. A little bit about our, our, our budgeting process, um, the communications and, and relationship in the city manager's report. Um, you know, we we all are very happy with where we're at, and 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 I've always said that I would be very respectful and make sure people know that I'm going to bring up something before uh, before we um, say something in public that isn't proper. So I always try to make sure that everyone knows where I'm coming from. When it comes to the budget, um, we have to obviously set the budget millage rate uh, at a maximum, and then we can discuss how we, we deal with it going forward. Uh, being a, on the budget committee for five years, I, I do feel that I have the utmost confidence in, um, in our uh, finance department. Uh, they've always been very conservative, which I think is the right approach. I don't think we have this wasteful spending, and I say this because we as a council don't get a chance to talk about these things um, unless we're here together. And certainly I look forward to hearing some of your comments about things as we go forward. And I don't know if I'm any expert, but I think I have a little bit of background on the budget. And I just want you to think about a few things as we go forward. And, and, and the city manager's uh, report does throw a, a wrench <laughs> in some of my, my, my thoughts. So I'm gonna kind of keep it a little more brief. But all in all, uh, we, we've done very well with our city. Um, we can't forget some of the fears we had 10 years ago and the, uh, sometimes the, 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 the jump to you know, cutting millage and, and working on less is always appealing to the, uh, to the taxpayer. But you know, we, we want to make sure that we're responsible. I don't think we have a, a city where we're wasting money and spending money unnecessarily. I think our budget is done very well uh, as, as every award comes through. Uh, we will be most likely, assuming that the um, voters pass a, a tax exemption. Sorry, Representative Roth, I'm not trying to make you feel bad, but I know you guys get to pat yourselves on the back for giving us all a, a tax cut. But you know, ideally, it would be nice if we at the local level had the opportunity to do that ourselves. But ultimately, it still benefits the residents as we go forward. Yes, our debt millage is going to be reduced. The big question that we have to ask ourselves is, what is, our, what is a reasonable source of income and what is a reasonable growth that we can expect to find in our city and, and what is gonna be some of the unanticipated costs that are gonna come down the pike? And obviously here we are just one day after putting all my thoughts down on paper, we have an unexpected cost. But we do have, we have had the luxury of a budget stabilization fund that has been funded well because we've always overestimated expenses on projects, we've always underestimated uh, revenues and as a result the budget stabilization fund has always had between two and four million dollars additional over the past five years so that's always been nice in addition when we talk about the the uh, one cent sales tax uh, we bonded out 30 million dollars we've expected to get a little bit more than that so some of the um, potential um, projects that we may want to run in the future may have some additional dollars available to us as well that doesn't mean that we want to start slashing budgets and slashing taxes, but at the same time, um, a few years ago, at the time, uh, Mayor Premoroso insisted on a, a small tax deduction or reduction, and it worked out just fine. So not that I'm suggesting we are going to jump to that conclusion today, but I want you to all, I think we all need just to think about where this is going to take us, what we are going to have as reasonable um, income projections, and and then and then if there's going to be any other unanticipated costs, so uh, I don't have any other comments beyond that. I don't want anyone to. If, of course, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to listen in. But all in all, I think we're in a good place, a really good place, um, and we might have a little more flexibility than we think. Anyone else? I would like to say that after your presentation last month about the twenty-five thousand dollar homestead exemption and the fact that. 
we may be making some of that up out of our reserves, if I remember correctly. There you go. Um, I would caution us. I know we all would love to lower our taxes, but I would caution us um, to not do anything impulsive given that we really don't know the true impact of what that $25,000 tax deduction is going to bring to us. Uh, and that would be the end of my comments. Well, and that's, that's just not it either. We need to hire police officers this year, and we're going to have to put a large amount of money into the fire, uh, the fire pension fund. So, um, you know, we have a, a large operating, I, I'm not sure how many officers were down, but it's not two or three. We're it's adding a, nine. Yeah. So, um, Are we adding nine? Maybe? Yeah. So we have, uh, you know, an operating budget to keep the community safe as well. And when I heard the extra, um, cause I was really trying to look for a reason to lower taxes as well. We all were. And even just a little bit. And then when that extra homestead exemption came out, I, I put the brakes on my thought. But having multiple conversations with, with Ron and accounting, even if this hits us with our budget stabilization fund, we most likely won't have to raise taxes next year. We're going to come out of this clean for now, which I think is still a feather in our cap. Right. And we need to tread carefully um, so we're not raising taxes and we keep, and we keep our our level of service the way it is. So that's my thoughts on it. Well, the most important thing for us is our level of service to our residents. Right. And we have growth and we have to manage that growth. So we need to be careful and watchful. And you all have done a great job in your five-year forecast. So um, seeing no more discussion, I'd like to adjourn this meeting. So moved. Thank you very much. Thank you.